Thank you. So, Aris, do you want to take over? This is an outstanding question, and any kind of medical imaging technology needed to be validated, and particularly for source imaging techniques. So I think this is a very important scientific question. Uh, in our uh, Nature Communication paper we published one month ago, and actually we validated technique with clinical ground truth in the sense that we compare with invasive recording inside the brain in the same human patient and with our source image result. We further validate our result in a particular pathological brain condition that's epilepsy. So after surgical resection, seizure is gone. If you image is a source, that source is gone and seizure is, um, is gone, then that's a second validation. So I welcome uh, people to um, download some, I and mean, we open the source, by the way, we open the entire source imaging algorithm. And every, it's open to everybody in the world, in the GitHub. If you go to our paper, you, you can download the, the imaging algorithm. And also we share a lot of data in that uh, science robotics paper. We share about 70 gigabyte, uh, I recall about, okay. 70 gigabyte data in 62 human subjects. So everything is on the internet. Thank you. Okay, it's great. Uh, actually, you know, uh, the last part of your talk, you talk about the yoga, right? The, you know, the people doing yoga can get, you know, a uh, good experience with this kind of, you know, trainings. So maybe Tony is the best example, you know, can be helpful. He do a very good yoga. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So, I think now after your talk, I will inspire me to do more yoga. Uh, before that, I do 20 minutes yoga, now I'm going to do uh, two hours yoga every day, yeah. Okay, Tony, and then I will very much uh, invite you to as a special subject for our research. Okay, good, good. I, I love I, I'm it. sure you don't have the time. <laughs> yeah, I have the time, I have time. I have time for yoga anytime, yes. No. Uh, yes. Oh, it is great. Now we already start our dialogue part, and I can add the talks. Every week we will invite the, uh, uh, the speakers and the hosters and uh, our audience to join this dialogue to talk something about what you interest. Today the topic is for artificial intelligence in biomedical applications. Actually, Professor Ho already gave a big demo, you know, in this field, and I think everyone has many imaginations on this. And uh, okay, here we go down to, you know, have a Gu Zhen. Yeah, so can you shake hands? Yeah, so yes. uh, everyone know. Yes. Yeah, yeah Gu Zhen will be the next speaker. So he's going to talk more about the biomedical applications. I think you just now you uh, listen to the talks from the artificial intelligence for how to control this. So is that possible to give you some ideas, you know, for you a smart patch can be co-linked with this, get more information, you know, to help for the biomedical applications? Yes, sure. I think it's a right terrific talk and uh, especially, you know, uh, to link this kind of EG signal, you know, to the um, this kind of actions of actions, something like that. And uh, uh, potentially, let's say we are doing the uh, control drive delivery and uh, may also like integrate this kind of, um, you know, electronic signal you know, to um, precisely control the release of drug. You know, this could be, uh, you know, wonderful direction. Let's see. Yes, great. Yeah, I think, you know, lately all this kind of electro signal, physical signal, chemical signal will go together, you know, to find the final resolu uh, you know, uh, resolution. Yeah, so Tony, yes, yes. yeah, so you you remember first time you make these words as very popular, Niu. Now it looks like, you know, Professor He was using Gershan Daniel too, because he didn't, you know, invade into the yeah, brain, but he got all the signals. So, yeah, 
uh, any comments here or something you know can be co-linked to with this thing? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> Professor also mentioned a little bit that, uh, you know, uh, that also some people also some of the work from his lab, uh, people using acoustic wave, uh, <clears throat> to kind of uh, to, uh, image and also to uh, to do uh, therapy. I, I really think acoustic wave uh, can do a lot of things, especially uh, non-invasive uh, therapy and also imaging. Uh, uh, just acoustic, I think the, the, the field of acoustic imaging and also uh, uh, therapy, I think the field need, need to push forward. And uh, uh, but I, I learned a lot from Professor Hurst's talk today. I think uh, I, when I go back uh, you know, to my lab, I need to talk to my students, see how we can uh, utilize our acoustic wave to do uh, brain uh, computer interface. Okay, yeah, that's great. Now, Xu Sheng, yeah, you graduated from a chemistry school, but now you do a lot of things for physical, you know, to detecting all these biosignals. So here's your time to share with us. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this exciting group. And I got very much uh, uh, inspired by Professor Hurst's talk on those uh, neuron um, uh, interface to uh, pick up those neural activity and command any robotics or any flying objects uh, in the outer field. And um, uh, uh, I was like thinking uh, because of this um, limit, limited spatial resolution of EEG and some other sensory modality, is it possible to use some like a shorter wavelengths um, uh, probing a mechanism to have a higher spatial resolution rather than one millimeter of this uh, MRI. Uh, I know the, the skull of a human is very really thick. Uh, uh, so those um, uh, short wavelengths light may have very limited uh, penetration. So is it possible to study some um, uh, those uh, simpler systems using those uh, shorter wavelengths light to you know, get a better understanding of this neural net, net, uh, network activity first? Well, yeah, Shen, this is a great idea. And uh, clearly, uh, we, uh, I, I mentioned functional MRI and EEG, MEG, because these are the established modality out there. Uh, clearly, we all know this limitation, yeah, like spatial resolution, even functional MRI. But by the way, I talk about one millimeter is for three Tesla MRI machine. So there's an ultra high, you know, field MRI machines these days, not uh, clinically used yet, but that's going to push down to much better spatial resolution, uh, but still is not, uh, you're never going to get a single and, and neurons activity, non-invasive. So any other idea I think is what uh, this field need and uh, what uh, you mentioned, but the only thing we don't know is if it would work. So we will need a lot of young students to get into this field. Hopefully we'll come out with some new approach. One particular thing I didn't have time to explain, but actually we have very active research program in my lab as well. As Tony mentioned is we have two NIH grant to study this transcranial focused ultrasound neuromodulation. That is to deliver the ultrasound with a very focal and that resolution can be as good as one millimeter, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's more for the encoding, not for decoding at this time, so. And you have in the panel, Professor Gu, Professor Xu, and myself, we all work on micro nanotechnologies. And hopefully, you know, some of our expertise and uh, people from others uh, in micro nanotechnologies can really uh, work with uh, experts like uh, Professor Her can contribute to this field and bring the resolution even to, to the next level. Absolutely. The field need, a, need an expert like three of you. <laughs> and, uh, because <laughs> for my field, and what I, uh, I showed you, Oh yeah, you're four of you, or even more. Like yes, what my work, and uh, we don't have any new sensors, and uh, but we are really innovating this machine learning algorithm. But but we need to have a better sensor device and system. And so four of you. <laughs> I think, you know, four of you are really doing a wonderful job and the majority is the, the common, uh, the common, you know, uh, opportunity here is all of you doing the things was not implantable. Yeah, it's not in vape, uh, it's all out of the body, right? It's a detection on that. I think that's a 
what's the big benefit for this? You know, like Professor He, can you compare with that in this artificial intelligence BCI field? You know, I see many people was use in wave and use non in wave. So what's a big benefit, and uh, can you compare with that? Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Zhang, it's a great question. I think the question really is uh, depending on the goal. If the goal is just try to achieve, you know, scientifically, you want to have a more precise control, then certainly invasive approach is going to give you better result because you can record neural spike, local field potential, and, and that is absolutely, regardless of whatever machine learning you're going to do, you cannot improve EEG signal better than the invasive recording. But on the other hand, the question is, if the goal is to develop a BCI technology to help many, many patients, or even to help a general population, then in that case, the invasive approach is limited not by technology, but by its application platform, because you just think about a patient already is sick. If you ask that, do you mind I open a skull and I implant something because I can help you something? That is a one limitation. The second limitation is it probably will never get to general population. And my dream is to make a BCI something like a smartphone. It's not That's something something you cannot live without it, but these days it will be very difficult if you don't have a smartphone in your life. And for that, I really wish that a non-invasive BCI would become something helping everyone involved, including every one of us. Thank you. Great answers. So Gu Zhen, yeah, maybe this, uh, yeah, your great opportunity here is for all this, the smart patch, try to have more patients. I think it's uh, much better than, you, you know, every day do some injections. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, yeah sure. how yeah. is that going? So actually this kind of non-invasive uh, treatment method or like a minimally invasive treatment method actually can significantly uh, enhance the uh, quality of life of people and uh, especially compared to the general this kind of uh, injections and the IV injection or some continuous injection uh, such like a, a transdermal based delivery actually much better and uh, also uh, another thing is like uh, uh, regarding the uh, safety for this kind of for example uh, intravenous injection and you deliver all the drug actually to the body. And if like some of them like with some toxicity, it's really hard to get rid of them from the body. However, this kind of uh, transdermal delivery method, you can stop this kind of treatment at any time. If you feel like uncomfortable, you can just stop this kind of treatment, just get rid of it. And then, you know, especially regarding um, the safety, uh, regarding the uh, cardio life and the, such, a non-invasive or minimally invasive treatment method is like a, a certainly is such a great opportunity or advantage. Yeah. And of course, how about the some, cost? How about the cost? Is the cost can be lower? You know. Yeah, sure. So the uh, the cost is certainly also associated with uh, the materials used, associated with the manufacturing uh, method. You know, and uh, uh, especially at this moment for our devices, I will introduce next. It's like, you know, based on this kind of uh, chemical uh, materials, uh, synthetic materials. And, you know, it's like not that, um, let's say, expensive, especially uh, the manufacturing way is like also uh, not that uh, complicated. And it certainly could be cheaper and cheaper based on this kind of uh, improvement. Okay, great. We're all looking for that. Yeah, I see many, many yeah. people you know, in the audience are looking for that. Tony, use acoustic wave. Can it be better than anything else? <laughs> well, I think it's, I, I say that. I think I'm going to have a lot of enemies after the talk if I say acoustic wave. Uh, but I, what I can say is uh, acoustic wave itself, uh, na you know, by nature, is a, is a more, is a non-invasive uh, uh, technique in terms of, so in, in that aspect, uh, you know, doing, uh, uh, doing uh, you know, drug delivery or doing uh, uh, imaging, I think it has some certain advantages. Um, and today I'm here to learn, I'm not just to say how good my technology, I think I'm, I'm, I'm excited to learn what Professor Hurst technology and also Professor Gus. And already then uh, Professor uh, Hurst uh, talked today and uh, Professor Gus talked. Actually, I'm, it's very personal to me because my blood sugar is also a little bit high. 
uh, what I heard is um, uh, half of the population in China uh, blood sugar rate is actually is, is higher than normal range. So I think uh, I very much look forward to see Professor Gu's uh, technology, the smart patch, will actually go to market and can benefit people like, uh, like myself. Okay, you. your blood sugar is high. Yoga to yeah. reduce blood sugar level, but it's not that. <laughs> <laughs> I need a blood patch. Different the way. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, my blood sugar is higher too, and my you know blood pressure is higher too. So Shishan, can you help to detect this? You know, yeah, without that heavy kind of equipment. Yeah, um, uh, we are now developing a wearable uh, patches on the, uh, sensing those blood pressure levels continuously without using any uh, invasive uh, uh, technolo uh, technologies. So this is also based on this acoustical wave uh, that can be emitted into the uh, emitted into the uh, human body to sense the vessel diameter. And in our case, um, uh, we are not really particular about the location of the skin. Say, for example, if we are interested in any artery uh, in the human body, we can integrate this patch on a location where there is an artery, for example, in your neck, in your arm, or in your wrist, right? So for uh, Professor Gu Zhen's uh, work for the drug delivery, if you want to uh, deliver some drug to a certain part of the organ, does really the uh, part of the skin matter? Say for example, uh, if you want to deliver the insulin to your, you know, um, uh, kidney or to some other parts of, you know, the the, world, uh, the body, uh, does the skin, does the patch have to be really close to the uh, kidney or can it be on the head or on the neck? Okay, it yeah. is really, really interesting. Yeah, I think today we have uh, really co-linked each other. Te not only the technologies, all these kind of topics is really close. I think in the future, you know, uh, in my imagination, in the future for this kind of medical applications, maybe majority, you know, can help from outside. Early detection, right? Early detection and the easily to get to the precision localization. And then, you know, you can, you know, do like uh, in Chinese is a brother, the senior brother of a bian chue. You know, you, you already early know all these things. Then, you know, you can, you know, do something even early before it was founded. It was really evaluated, uh, evaluated into a disease. We can do something, you know, for early detection, you know, early, you know, kind of yeah, modification and something, you know, can help to drug delivery and even change the metal, right? Yeah, change the metal. Don't think about that. Right? This work don't work. Right? Yeah, this also can work too. That's really, really great future. You know, we can do a lot of things by the technology, even not implantable in the body, not in wave, not, you know, cut anything, not, you know, inject anything. We can, you know, help from outside. I think that's great future. So I think in the audience, a lot of people is really, really curious about what's the future for the artificial intelligence, you know? Yeah, what's the future for go on in these directions? I just give my imaginations. And uh, this will be, you know, in end of the dialogue. I want to you four, you know, experts in this field to everyone give one, you know, kind of, in your imagine, what's this kind of, uh, artificial intelligence will go further for to help the biomedical applications. Okay, who we'll start first? The who? Who? You go. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, uh, I think, a very important question. Um, the artificial intelligence. I think what what, what I mean in the the research example I have shown is for specific research problem. And one thing I know that there's a lot of controversial in the field, but uh, personally, I feel it could become eventually a reality is that um, we have very limited medical resource in the world. And uh, in the sense that, uh, from, for example, in China, there's a Sanjia hospital or in a lot of the big city, but it may not be available in every city and or maybe even in some not um, the city and not in, in China, there are many other countries in the world. So the artificial intelligence, one possible application in my 
personal observation is that we could, the data collection, we need uh, um, for our year to develop a novel with this uh, data collection technique. But once you collect the data, these can be sent to a central processing station. You can put into the best medical expertise in the world to read the data, to interpret, to, to diagnose, and sending back as a clinical decision back to whatever hospital in the world, even no hospital. Then in that way, I feel someday that artificial intelligence could help really many, many people in the world. So that's my um, a biased observation. Okay, great. Go, Jen. Your sure. turn. So, yeah, for me, uh, AI for biomedical applications actually definitely have like many great opportunities here. And especially, you know, based on the development, based on this kind of deeper understanding of this kind of uh, physiological for example, the fundamental stuff regarding, for example, the neural activity, regarding this kind of uh, physiological, this kind of interaction in our body. And uh, um, for drug delivery, you know, uh, one thing is that we can uh, combine the sensing, uh, the sensors together with uh, um, the, you know, the drug delivery systems to form such like, for example, the closed loop system. I will briefly mention yes also. And then we can, uh, you know, sense this kind of uh, risks of the certain uh, diseases, for example, regarding the cardiovascular um, and the, regarding this kind of stroke, and then you know quickly deliver drug to the body, and then to um, save life or you know to reduce the risk of this kind of uh, diseases. Then it could be really like uh, uh, helpful for patients, for or people potentially may have some like a risk. Tony, yeah, I I, I just. Uh, make two points. I, I think uh, first point is I think for uh, AI to have uh, a, a really a real impact in medicine, I think it really takes uh, you know uh, researchers from different backgrounds to really work to, uh, together. I, I think Professor He is a great example. He uh, he's a uh, uh, electrical engineer essentially uh, by training, but uh, you know he he worked very closely with you know uh, people in computer science, uh, people uh, yeah, from uh, from in medicine, uh, so that his technology can really uh, move forward. And in the future, he also want, want to work with people like us who work on uh, micro nano technology. I think that's that's what is we need uh, needed. Uh, people work people in the field of math, physics, engineering, and medicine, biology really work, work together. Uh, second point I would like to make is uh, uh, I think for our technologies to you know to have impact, we really need to make it uh, inexpensive and accessible. I, I, again. I, Professor He is a, a good example. He want to make his technology like a cell phone. That's something is needed. Right? Uh, but that's something also personal to me because uh, uh, my parents they live in uh, uh, you know the, uh, 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 Hubei, uh, a rural part of Hubei, uh, uh, so they don't have access to Sanjia. They don't have access to big hospitals or the best uh, uh, you know the equipment. But uh, if we can make our technologies as expensive, as portable as cell phone, then we can really impact people like my parents, my, like my grandma. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I like the idea. So, Sheng, Xu Sheng? Yeah, um, uh, personally, I'm not a uh, expert in AI. And uh, as you mentioned, I was trained as a chemist and a material scientist. But I was so fortunate to have some uh, very smart, uh, bright students in my group. And I learned some uh, secondary, uh, secondary uh, knowledge from them. And uh, so I'm a secondhand smoker. Um, uh, from my students. And uh, I have two uh, comments here. Uh, the first thing is AI is really powerful to find out some pattern from those uh, continuous data streams you can collect with your devices, sensors. For example, wearable EEG or this continuous sensing of those uh, uh, wearable patches, or even this drug delivery you know, uh, response uh, uh, pattern, right? So they can, they can uh, dig a lot of uh, insights, information from those data stream, uh, but they also need to be trained. Then that means those data, those algorithms will need to find a model they can leverage. They can gain some you know, um, um, uh, insights, you know, so that they can apply those insights to an, you know, a new, uh, uh, data stream. So that's something good. You know, that's uh, what the beyond you know those uh, materials device you know area. However, another thing with AI is that um, it's a tool 
it cannot create new physics. It cannot create like um, a new principles. I think uh, the fundamental, the bottom line, the basis is still the uh, device, the sensor. We have to produce better devices. We have to produce better sensors, more channels of EEG, more uh, uh, higher spatial resolution, temporal resolution EEG, so that we can decode those um, uh, unprecedented amount of data for those AI algorithms to an uh, analyze. So those, you know, the pros and cons, I think AI is, is exciting, is interesting, but that does not uh, diminish the, uh, the need or the, uh, the, 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 the importance of those device areas. So that's my two cents. Great point. I think we totally agree with that. We need more sensors, more actuators, more things, you know, from different parties and even many multi, you know, disciplinary, you know, yeah, cross link works on this field. We make future, uh, exactly, you know, we can have something like this, right? To help everyone to get like a lively, you know, component. Yeah, okay, thank you so much for everyone. Enjoy this ICANX dialogue. I think now we can cheers. Yeah, so for this uh, successful, you know, ICANX dialogue. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. okay, cheers. Yeah. Yeah. cheers. Okay, now Xu Sheng is come to your time. You are our uh, guest host, you know, to host for Gu Zhen's talk. So, you know, I have added my words here. Xu Sheng looks like a graduate school student, but actually he is already a professor and a very famous professor. So, yeah, please. Okay, Professor Xu, it's your time. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Zhang, for the nice introduction. Uh, it's my tremendous honor and pressure, uh, pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Gu Zheng, Zheng Gu from uh, UCLA. He's a professor in the Department of Bioengineering and director of the NIH Biotechnology Training Center in Biomedical Science and Engineering of NIH. And um, uh, before he joined the UCLA, he was already a uh, distinguished professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill within six years. So for those of you uh, who are not very really familiar with those uh, academic ranking in the United States, uh, typically we start from assistant professor. And after, you know, typically six years to get promoted to associate. And after, you know, a couple more years get to, you know, full professor. And then after a couple more years get to, you know, uh, hopefully to distinguished professor. So uh, Professor Gu, you know, achieved those three steps, major milestones, all within six years. So, so that's how amazing it is. And um, his work is mostly um, uh, uh, focused on those uh, wearable uh, patches for uh, those, um, you know, um, drug design, uh, smart um, uh, uh, drug delivery for um, uh, um, uh, diabetes and cancer and some infectious diseases. He devised a really smart um, uh, drug delivery system that uh, allows those drug molecules to sense and decide uh, how much and when to deliver those drugs into, this, into the system. So it's really a, um, a bi-inspired uh, um, a smart uh, uh, system that mimics those human beta cells or some other uh, systems. So uh, Professor Gu has already been a very prolific um, uh, um, uh, researcher and uh, he published uh, uh, many papers, outstanding papers and the patterns. And um, uh, he's not only uh, very active in academia, but also have been uh, co-founded, have uh, co-founded five startup companies. And at least one of them is going through this FDA clearance, you know, to the best of my knowledge. And he's also serving actively to the communities, um, uh, he's an associate editor of science advances and also nano research. So because of his like a um, uh, outstanding trajectory, he has received numerous awards. So I'm not going to go through the entire list of this award. You can you know all read uh, his bio, which is available online. And um, I just want to uh, uh, tell you that um, you know uh, I personally I work very hard. You know I work pretty much every day. And, but I also have down times. I, 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 sometimes I feel tired. I do not want to work. But whenever I do not want to work, I would find out that Professor Gu's uh, uh, research, you know, um, uh, 
papers and uh, he's like a bio sketch to get some inspiration. And after that, I will have more motivation to work harder. So he's a really an inspiring role model. So without a further ado, and uh, uh, then this is all yours. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful introduction. I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah. So I will share my slides now. Right, so uh, thank you so much for uh, since the introduction and I really appreciate uh, Alice's uh, invitation. Um, it's my great uh, pleasure to share our latest studies with you today, uh, especially focused on the bioresponsible drug delivery. So it's actually still like quite early morning in Los Angeles and probably you can still hear the birds singing outside, hardly, let's say. So uh, this is a company interest slide, and the part of our work uh, I will introduce next, uh, supported by Sanofi and our own startup company, um, the uh, the capsule and the dynamics. So we run a lab called I Medication, trying to integrate a biomaterial design, uh, biomolecular engineering, as well as the micro nano fabrication together uh, to form uh, such uh, let's say versatile formulations and potentially for the treatment of uh, cancer, diabetes, as well as for the application of regenerative medicine. So as you know that in our body, always associated with specific diseases, specific organs, tissues, the physiological signals could be different from these kind of normal conditions and uh, or healthy conditions in terms of the absolute concentration or relative gradient. So then you can leverage such difference, you know, to uh, promote the release of the drug therapeutics, and then to enhance their treatment and efficacy, or you know, to reduce uh, side effects, and then potentially also enhance the quality of life of people with different diseases. And we could like uh, to release the drug at the right time, right places, with relatively correct dose or smart drug delivery. So, for example, in the tumor site, it's a bitter acidic. And then you can develop some acidic sense to materials or formulations to encapsulate the uh, anti-cancer drug inside. And then uh, to deliver such like, for example, nanoparticles or uh, micro, uh, uh, you know, such structures, scaffolds uh, to the tumor microenvironment. Then uh, due to the um, dissociation or dissolve of these kind of materials, the drug can be quickly released outside and to enhance the killing effect. Certainly, you can further deliver such formulations inside the cells. Um, for example, in the anisome or lysosome, could be more acidic. Then can further boost the treatment and efficacy. And for diabetes treatment, the increased blood sugar level can be uh, leveraged to quickly release insulin and to maintain the blood sugar level in a normal range. And this is actually I will uh, introduce next. And also associated with the wood site, associated with the stuke site. And you can also identify the different biomarkers and then later on to leverage such triggers to promote a release of drug and to enhance the efficacy and potentially reduce the toxicity. So regarding the uh, design of such drug delivery systems, formulations or devices, we are pretty interested in using the bio-inspired or biomimetical design and with two directions. One is like to uh, directly apply uh, biological particles, for example, the cells, uh, the virus, and the, or like a uh, protein, um, they potentially already in our body, and then we can uh, change them or convert them into the drug delivery carriers. And later on, we can load the drug, you know, on the surface or inside of the uh, such carriers, and especially to leverage their targeting capability, um, as well as the uh, you know release behavior, and to enhance the treatment and efficacy. And certainly such particles are already inside our body. So that means potentially regarding the biocompatibility, um, you know, could be uh, quite excellent. And uh, another direction is like we can mimic such targeting capability or target release behavior of the biological particles and to apply the synthetic materials to engineer such 
synthetic formulations or devices and uh, to release the drug, for example, at the right time or at the you know, specific places. And uh, certainly, here is like a very standard materials can be used and potentially regarding the manufacturing, regarding the cardio control for the B other compared to other systems. And for example, here is like we apply the patent as carriers for anti-cancer drug delivery and for cancer immunotherapy and also engineers such as cell conjugate, I will mention next. And we are um, inspired by this kind of bio glue, the fibrin gel inside the body, and we develop this kind of sprayable gels for cancer immunotherapy. And we can also uh, create such uh, synthetic beta cells for uh, smart insulin delivery and a smart insulin patch. This is also today's focus. So as you know that diabetes is currently a global burden affecting around 400 million people. And every eight seconds, one dies from diabetes. And this number will be further increased to be like over 600 million by 2045. So this is actually a really uh, challenging issue. And the insulin is, is a hormone uh, generated and stored in the beta cells of the pancreas. And the active format of insulin, the monomer actually can bind to the insulin receptor especially associated with the cell membrane of the fatter liver and the muscle tissues. And then can upregulate um, or increase, for example, the glucose transporter on the surface of cell membrane. And then allow the glucose enter cells through the glucose transporter to perform the downstream uh, metabolism. And th that means the insulin just like the key to open the door, allow the glucose go inside to cells uh, to uh, to do this kind of actions. So that means to promote the cells can eat the glucose and to reduce the glucose level in the serum. However, for people with type 1 diabetes, due to the autoimmune reaction, beta cells are damaged. So they can't produce insulin as they need. And for people with type 2 diabetes, um, the beta cells still there, they can still secrete the insulin. However, due to the insulin resistance, uh, more insulin is needed. So as the traditional treatment method, we call it an open loop based method, uh, people need to monitor their blood sugar levels frequently, then perform the multiple injections every day, which is quite painful. You can say here, this is, uh, you know, people's like a two big supply of syringes, a lot. And uh, uh, if you inject too much insulin, it can cause a hypoglycemia, which is fatal and dangerous. And uh, very importantly, it's really hard to tightly follow the glucose level change to infuse insulin to the body. So as a result, many diabetes complications occur. However, in a healthy body, the insulin secretion level always strictly follow the blood sugar level changes. And you can see uh, the red line associated with the blood sugar level changes. So typically we have three meals every day, and then here, three major peaks. And Meanwhile, you can see three very tight peaks, actually the blue line associated with the serum insulin level, okay? So it's like they have very tight relationship because the beta cells are naturally smart. They can sense the brush level and secrete the insulin at the right time with a relatively correct dose. So I will actually mention some mechanism uh, next. So then it's really uh, important, uh, very urgent to identify a better solution for glucose control. And typically people have already developed uh, different uh, strategies. Uh, one way is like to uh, encapsulate the eyelids or beta cells in the biocompatible materials, capsules and later implantable, implanted to the body. And uh, you know, the glucose, the oxygen, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the nutrition can go inside and the insulin can um, you know, secrete and release outside. However, how to maintain such capsules inside the body for a long time? Um, this, this is actually really an uh, urgent task in this field. And another direction is like to mimic the beta cell or iris function. And typically, people already develop the, the artificial electronic pump or pancreas. And this especially with two components. One is the sensor uh, implanted to the body, and it can sense the glucose level and it pass the signal to a certain pump. And after, after certain calculation with a certain algorithm, uh, the certain amount of insulin can be infused to the body. And uh, today, um, how to make the systems like uh, more precise? 
uh, especially how to enhance the algorithm system. This is actually also the major task of this field. And uh, uh, people still need to run the calibration, get the brush level, and to measure it to make sure all the device is actually on the right track. And after a few days, still need to replace the sensor here, also needle here. Otherwise, the fibrosis will be formed and to affect the performance of the device. And this year, um, people have become more and more interested in developing the synthetic uh, biochemical device uh, to mimic the function of the beta cells and to release insulin at the right time. And this is our research focus. And the, the motivation here is like, uh, uh, in our body, we don't have any battery. We don't have any electronic devices, components. But we can well control the brush level just based on the, um, you know, the chemical reactions or biosignaling process inside the beta cells. Then why not like uh, apply the synthetic materials or modify the insulin to mimic such uh, process, such reactions to potentially achieve the glucose responsible uh, insulin delivery. So basically, for the synthetic uh, glucose responsible smart insulin delivery systems, we also created like a synthetic artificial pancreas also involve two key elements. One is the factor that can sense the glucose level, basically it's the sensor, but not like provided the, uh, you know, the, the detailed uh, the data, but actually they pass to the tutor, this could be the materials or the modified insulin, and then to trigger the release of insulin at the right time. Especially once the brush level goes high, more insulin can be promoted to release from certain formulation or devices. And then the cells can eat the uh, glucose and then brush level become uh, normal and then less insulin released or just like a basal release. However, there are still like uh, several challenges for smart insulin delivery. For example, how to achieve faster response the PK in pharmacokinetics similar to the normal beta cell activity. How to avoid the hypoglycemia, probably could delivery of glucagon, and this is actually uh, another format which can increase the brush level. And how to realize either a treatment to further reduce the injection times or apply the painless uh, based treatment method. I will introduce the microneedle ray patch next. And also, uh, associated with the biomaterials, how to solve the biocompatibility issue. This is always a tough issue here. And let's say five years ago, uh, we reported the first prototype of the smart insulin patch in PS. And the basic idea is like to integrate the glucose responsive insulin release formulation together with the painless microneedle array patch. And this is our first generation. Based on this enzymatic reaction, the glucose oxidase, the enzyme, can convert the glucose into the gluconic acid. And then on the left side, uh, the oxygen level actually reduced. So then we can involve the hypoxia responsible material to form the glucose responsible formulation. So we started with the, uh, the, the hyaluronic acid, which is very biocompatible polysaccharide. And we modified the natural amino group to the HA hyaluronic acid molecule. And this part is quite a hydrophobic. And the hyaluronic acid is like a hydrophilic or water soluble. So this is the amphiphytic structure and they can self assemble into such micelle or vesicle like structure to encapsulate the insulin and the, the enzyme glucose oxidase inside. And once the brush level goes high, the local oxygen level reduced and this one will undergo a bioreduction process and then become like a more water soluble. So the natural group will become like a main group. And then the structure will be more water soluble, then can be dissociated and the insulin can be promoted to release outside. And once the insulin is outside and the, the um, glucose level goes down and the, such dissociation process will be inhibited and potentially can last a long time. And yes, we embed such um, particles inside the microneedle ray patch to achieve the EDO treatment. And the microneedle ray patch, you can see here, the needle, the lens is like a, a smaller typically uh, than 800 micrometer. And as you know that the most nerve cells underneath the skin typically like a one micrometer or 
actually one millimeter or one thousand micrometer away from the surface of the skin. So then once you apply the patch to the skin, they won't interact with the nerve cells that significantly. So that's why we call it like a painless based treatment method. And here's like an electronic microscope image of such particles, glucose responsible particles. And especially uh, once we put such particles in the high glucose level based solution, and gradually you can see they will be dissociated and then promote a release of insulin here, especially compared to the normal glucose level or PBS only. And we apply such mode based method to form the microneedle ray patch. And this is like a silicone mode. And we mix our formulation together with the hyaluronic acid. And then we pour such solution to the mold. And after drying it with a certain photopolymerization, and the uniform structure of the microneedle array patch can be formed and with the sufficient stiffness. And once I talk about the microneedle array patch, I always like to show you this picture. And then you can see here the selling point of this picture. Actually, it's not a, this guy, actually, the second one is waiting in a line quite nervous, right? And the other people still like smiling and laughing because they are not the second one. Okay, so potentially with the micro needle ray patch, you don't have to worry about you will be the second person within in the line quite nervous. You can easily put the patch to your body, to your arm, and for the uh, next treatment. And we apply such patch to the uh, mice, and you can see they can easily be treated to the uh, skin of the mice and quickly reduce the brush level from high level over 500 milligram per deciliter to uh, below 200 milligram per deciliter. Actually, this is a normal range of the mice with type 1 diabetes. And uh, uh, you can see the native uh, insulin based patch. And we just put the pure insulin in the patch. And due to the passive release, our brush level went down quickly and went up quickly. Right? You can see the significant difference here. And meanwhile, we cut off half amount of the enzyme here. And you can see the red line, the blood glucose level change, not that dramatic compared to the uh, black line. Okay, so that means potentially we can based on the people with diabetes, you know, that average glucose level, that general conditions, and we can design the different patches with different uh, amounts of the glucose sensing components or insulin inside. And then, you know, we can potentially achieve the personalized medication. And before they perform this kind of study, we put the one patch on, the brush level went down to uh, the second point, around 200 milligram per deciliter. Then for the smart insulin patch, and you can see the brush level can still like maintain there for a while, then gradually increase, right? However, for the patch, if it's just the native insulin there, the brush level will further go down even to achieve the hypoglycemia, which is quite dangerous. So we call the smart insulin patch not only can quickly respond to the high brush level and reduce the glucose level to a normal range, but also they can sense the uh, normal glucose level or uh, hypoglycemic state and then to reduce the risk of the hypoglycemia. So not only address the um, efficacy issue, but also address the safety concern. And in our lab, you know, we um, at the same time run this kind of different design regarding the glucose responsible insulin delivery systems. Since the microneedle ray patch, this is just a platform technology, right? And this is just a drug delivery tool and we can load the different formulations or like a modified insulin there to potentially achieve the different formulations devices for the glucose responsible insulin release. And then we will actually select the probably the best one from such uh, devices and bring it forward uh, for the potentially uh, the clinical trials. And this is our another design. And this time we directly mimic the function of the insulin granules or vesicles inside the beta cell. And this is the TEM image of the beta cells. And you can see this is the membrane of the beta cells. And here's like the granules, insulin granules, insulin store inside and waiting there. And especially once the brush level goes high, glucose coming and due to this kind of uh, complicated reactions. And then you can see eventually the calcium ion channel will be open. And the calcium ion can go inside and then it can bind to the SNAP protein associated with the uh, insulin vesicles 
and to activate it, allow it to further uh, interact with another uh, SNAP proteins associated with the same membrane them to promote the fusion process to release the insulin uh, transponity. So we really want to like uh, mimic this kind of process, you know, to uh, achieve the glucose response through insulin delivery. And as you can see, this is a really elegant uh, process, right? And we want to like uh, simplify, and but still like follow the fusion mediated uh, response mechanism. So then we develop such a vesicle in vesicle based formulation. We call it a synthetic artificial beta cells, especially uh, based on the building blocks of the lipids. And we made a larger vesicle as the beta cell membrane. And we also inside we have a smaller uh, particles, uh, liposome based particles, and with insulin encapsulated. And especially once the uh, branch level goes high, the glucose level uh, you know, um, can promote the glucose going inside the the such a large vesicle, and then especially with the enzyme here, the local pH can be decreased, and then can promote uh, the uh, the exposure of the peptide K molecule, and this one actually can further interact with the peptide E, and to form such core to core structure, and to make them closely, you know, uh, to interact with each other, and then to promote the fusion process to uh, eventually release the insulin outside especially you follow such a uh, glucose response mechanism. And you can see this is the cryo uh, SEM image. You can see the large wax core and inside we have the smaller insulin uh, lapsomes. And here's like we found that such uh, synthetic artificial beta cells can respond to the uh, high brush level and quickly release the insulin. And then on the a normal glucose level, less insulin can be released. And the difference here could be eight to 10 times difference. Here's another formulation, and this time we synthesize a polymer with two components. Here's like with amine group, so basically it's like a very uh, positive charge uh, component on the, a neutral pH level. And this component is like a phenylbranic acid, and this one actually can bind to the glucose level, especially bind to the glucose with the dial group, right? And here's like to form such a more negative charged uh, component. So originally, since this polymer is highly positive charged, so then it can interact with the insulin to form the polymer insulin complex. And uh, especially based on electrical static force, and once the glucose level goes high, and then the polymer will become like a more negative charge, and the affinity between the uh, insulin and the polymer can be decreased, then can uh, naturally, you know, to promote the release of insulin from such a complex and to reduce the brush level. So we test on the uh, mice with type 1 diabetes, and you can see uh, once the brush level becomes normal and uh, we injected a glucose bolus, a high glucose level based solution to the mice, and there was a peak associated with the glucose level. You can see the red line. And meanwhile, later on, we also detected a peak associated with the insulin level. So this is actually very clear in vivo uh, glucose response to insulin release. And we also um, modify the insulin to make the insulin itself glucose responsible. And we call it like I insulin. So the basic idea is like to modify the glucose transporter inhibitor to the insulin. And as you know that the insulin can bind to the insulin receptor to reduce the brush level. And the, the um, glucose transporter inhibitor actually can uh, block the glucose transporter to increase the uh, brush level. So they actually have the operate uh, functions, but we link them together to form such a smart insulin. And we found that once we inject such a, um, insulin to the body, actually they can either bind it to the uh, insulin receptor or the glucose transporter. And the interesting things like uh, once brush level goes high, such a, uh, eye insulin can be quickly released from the cells and to reduce the brush level. And uh, once we inject too much uh, such a eye insulin, and they won't cause the hypoglycemia because they can potentially more like a block to the uh, glucose transporter and to um, inhibit or alleviate the uh, risk of the hypoglycemia. So as I said, it's like a, uh, you can um, involve the different formulations or modify insulin to the uh, patch 
and to achieve the different uh, uh, glucose response through smart insulin patches. So here's like the translation criteria. One thing is like uh, how to achieve the high loading capacity and to especially also maintain the uh, nice, you know, um, high uh, bioavailability of the insulin. Typically, it's still like with a small size. You don't want like the size is like really big, right? And uh, another thing is like uh, achieve the excellent biocompatibility. For insulin delivery, this is like a daily usage. You don't want like to deliver the materials to the body. You just want to like release the insulin to the body. And this is certainly very important. And the third thing is like regarding the manufacturing, how to be fast, be like um, for the manu manufacturing, like a uh, large scale manufacturing, also like uh, uh, maintain a low cost, very uh, important issue. So uh, later on, we um, license the technology to the, our startup companies so called uh, uh, Dynamics and trying to uh, bring the smart insulin patch to the clinical side. And uh, here's our latest uh, milestone. Let's say the quarter size the smart insulin patch could effectively regulate the brush levels of 25 kilogram type 1 diabetic pigs or over 55 pounds, actually in a normal range for 24 hours. So we are actually really excited and proud of such uh, results uh, because let's say five years ago, once we just published a paper in PNS and uh, we did receive some email uh, from uh, he or she and mentioned that, hey, Professor Gu, congratulations. Now you can treat mice with diabetes, but for human usage, probably far, far away. So he or she even helped us to calculate the dosage or the size you know, of the patch used for human. And said that based on the uh, size of the patch you used for the mice, for the size for human usage, you need a size probably over size of 60, 60 centimeter times 60 centimeter. So this is actually really huge patch, right? Think about that. Probably you need to wear some like a micro needle jacket and from back to the front to push the micro needle, right? To um, perform the glucose control. And now we can still like maintain size regarding like a quarter, we could have quarter sized uh, patch, but it can still like a well control this kind of clinically relevant uh, pig's glucose level. And in our design, actually, we identify the different monomers, and especially they can uh, form a homogeneous solution, especially with the insulin. And then we put this kind of uh, solution to the mold and directly actually uh, shine the UV to it to cross link it to form such uniform structure. And this time, actually, we also involve the phenylpronic acid here. And the whole structure actually is like a, a glucose response. Instead of, uh, you know, put this kind of nanoparticles there, and then with such a uh, uh, design, and we can significantly enhance the uh, loading capacity of the insulin, since the whole matrix of the micro needle actually can respond to the brush level, and you can load a sufficient insulin inside. And also, um, you can say, um, as I mentioned, it's, it's like you can stop this kind of treatment at any time. And we clear, you know, we, we, we claim that, you know, they can um, respond to the normal glucose level and to inhibit the um, hypoglycemia. And meanwhile, if people feel like uncomfortable, you can stop this kind of treatment at any time because this is like, a, uh, you know, just possible, right? You can remove it at any time. And this such a, method especially also with the uh, very easy manufacturing um, process. And we test on peak, especially with the continuous glucose monitoring system. And then you can see um, once the glucose response to smart insulin patch on, and after twice, uh, two times feeding, and the, after uh, 20 hours, the glucose level go up and then that means we can maintain there for a while, right? For like uh, over 20 hours. And for the control group, you can see after uh, one feeding, actually the brush level already, uh, you know, gradually uh, went up. And uh, uh, here's like a um, multiple uh, treatment. You can see put uh, one patch on and uh, after one day, the second patch on, and then they can maintain the brush level for over uh, 40 hours. And certainly, currently, we are also uh, testing like uh, over seven patches and then can maintain the brush level over one week. 
and uh, especially uh, once you remove the patch, you can see the major structure, the matrix still there. Okay, so that means the materials of the patch still like maintained, and certainly also be the uh, quite a limited toxicity irritation. And we also perform the glucose tolerance test. And here's like a three different peaks. And once the brush level becomes normal, and uh, we um, inject a bolus of glucose, and uh, that was a peak associated with the glucose level, and then quickly also a peak associated with the insulin level. Very clear glucose response um, insulin release in vivo. And the second time, that was also peak associated with the uh, insulin level. And the three peaks, the same trend. Here, yeah, I would like to uh, share my personal connection regarding diabetes. And this is my uh, grandma, and he, uh, she had diabetes uh, for several years. And uh, especially once I was a uh, kid, you know, uh, and I really uh, enjoy playing such syringes. And uh, um, I injected different solutions, uh, the um, alcohol or like a uh, uh, soy sauce, you know, to potatoes, tomatoes, right? And later, once I was in the primary school, I uh, invented such a uh, toothbrush for the lazy people, especially to link the syringe to the toothbrush. And here's the tubing and the toothpaste here, and you can completely actually to put the uh, toothpaste to the uh, uh, to the brush. So then, you know, um, working with Bob Langer, we further developed the toothpaste like an injectable gel, and especially with the nanoparticles. Uh, once we inject on each skin and they can maintain there for a while, for, for example, uh, over 10 days regarding the glucose control. And uh, furthermore, we developed the smart insulin patch as I just introduced. And the next things like uh, we are currently also working on the uh, smart insulin delivery through the oral pathway, we call the smart insulin pill. So here I would like to say the love and the fun actually is the arranging of the innovation. And more about our startup company dynamics and the country we are trying to translate our technology. Um, especially uh, last year, we joined the FDA's emerging technology program and we are trying to bring the technology for the uh, clinical trial. So next, I would like to share a video with you. Diabetes is a global burden affecting over 400 million adults in the world. The number of adults with diabetes has increased nearly fourfold since 1980. Many people living with type 1 and advanced type 2 diabetes require multiple daily insulin injections, which are painful, inconvenient, and require privacy. What if there was a treatment that was painless, simple, and discreet? And what if the dosage was self-regulated? Introducing the Smart Insulin Patch by Zenomics. It's a daily self-regulating patch with microneedles that can sense glucose levels and administer insulin as needed. So this Smart Insulin Patch is easily made by polymer together with the insulin loaded inside. Once penetrated into the skin, they respond to the high blood sugar level and quickly release insulin into the body. It can also reduce the risk of the hypoglycemia. This is really exciting technology using chemistry and physics to link blood sugars to release insulin at just the right time. If we can get this to work in people, it will change the landscape of diabetes and dramatically improve the lives of people with diabetes. We have successfully tested the patch on pigs with diabetes. Now we look forward to the next step. As someone who hopes to care for patients with diabetes in the future, being a part of this work is so energizing because it makes me hopeful and excited to see how the field of diabetes care will change due to scientists like Dr. Gu and his team. Painless, simple, and discreet, the Xenomics Smart Insulin Patch is ready to revolutionize insulin-based diabetes care. So later on we found that this could be a broad platform technology and we call it like a bioresponsible uh, microneedle array patch and especially we can load the different formulations, different drugs you know, to the microneedle array patch and later they can respond to the physiological signals, biomarkers associated with the different diseases. 
and later on to trigger the release of such a drug from the micro needle array patch. And later on, they can release it to the underneath the skin, you know, locally or through the capillary, uh, the broader capillary system or lympho system, you know, to the whole body, you know, potentially for the systemic treatment. So, for example, we further developed uh, the smart glucagon patch, which can respond to the local insulin level and to promote the release of the glucagon once the insulin level goes high, and then you know to um, potentially reduce the risk of the hypoglycemia. And the smart cell patch, we can link the live cells together maybe the micro needle array patch, for example, the beta cells, and then we can leave the uh, beta cells or IDs outside the body. And then they can still sense the glucose level inside and release the insulin. But uh, meanwhile, you know, definitely can uh, reduce the uh, immune response. And the smart heparin patch. Uh, here it's like uh, we uh, loaded the heparin in the micro array patch, which is a broader uh, thinner. And uh, this patch actually can respond to the swamping level associated uh, with the risk of the stroke. And uh, once such risk, you know, increases, and then the heparin can be released and potentially uh, can reduce the risk of the stroke. Uh, Anti-acne patch, and we actually change the shape of the patch and to this kind of swab or mention, and later on, you know, they can easily destroy the pimple or acne, right? And they can also uh, potentially release the antibiotics and to uh, boost this kind of treatment. And uh, the first author of this paper, uh, Daisy Zhang and the co-founder company with me, uh, called W skin. And you know why W here? They look like, like two micro needles, right? And we further apply such patch for different uh, applications, for example, for cosmetics. And this time we actually uh, especially loaded the stem cell asome together with some small molecule drug which can promote the hair regrowth uh, to the patch. And the major things like uh, uh, the matrix form here actually from a protein derived from here. And now we apply such patch for hair regrowth. And you can see uh, the mice treated with such patch here is like two patches. And after three weeks, you can see the hair actually is like a quite uh, you know uh, thick, right? And especially uh, compared to the control groups. And the hair is like three patches. And after three days, you can see such like a profile pro profile regarding the three patches. So potentially with such technology, maybe you can also like shave the hair and quickly put the patch on and form this kind of different patterns, relatively easy. You put like a hair lithography. And also you can put the patch to the heart, not only just the skin, right? It's like here, it's like for treating myocardial infarction, uh, collaborated with uh, my friend uh, at NC State, Curtin. And uh, also uh, here, it's like uh, not only for animals, for humans, you can also apply the patch uh, to plants, otherwise plants won't be heavy, right? And here's like we apply such patch for the um, uh, pest gene diagnosis, especially can quickly extract the DNA from the leaves from over the plants. And then later we can perform the PCR, something like that. And uh, here's like for the uh, cancer immunotherapy, and we can load the antibody, like uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1, pd one antibodies, or CTR4 antibodies to the patch, and locally, uh, for treating diseases like melanoma. And you may ask why you want to like, uh, uh, perform the local treatment instead of this kind of systemic treatment, right? So I will briefly introduce some background, especially the immune checkpoint inhibitor or immune checkpoint blocker therapy countries really promising uh, cancer immunotherapy and really show uh, very uh, terrific uh, outcomes in clinical side. And uh, basically the immune cells, uh, they're supposed to identify to recognize the tumor cells. And but the tumor cells actually, they can uh, pretend to be the normal cells, especially through the checkpoints. Because the normal cells actually through the checkpoints and then let the uh, immune cells let them go. And especially the pd one associated with normal cell and the uh, PD-1 receptor associated with the T cell. And later they can shake hands and then you know, can recognize the normal cells and let them go. And then the tumor cells actually, they also uh, have the PDR1, for example, and later they can also shake hands and the immune cells let them go. And then later can develop the tumor or metastasis. And uh, here you can apply the immune checkpoint inhibitors, such antibody, for example, the PD1 inhibitor, which can block the uh, PD1 receptor or PDL1 antibody, typically, let's say, uh, which can block the PDL1 ligand. And then 
broke this kind of interaction, right? Shaking hands, and the, the immune cells just let the, uh, just like, uh, let's say, re recognize the tumor cells and uh, to destroy them. And, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter, actually, uh, we call him like a, a popular patient regarding the immune checkpoint blocker therapy, especially uh, several years ago, treated by Marcus Katrina, and then the original, like uh, the manoma, transport to the brain, develop the brain tumor, then the brain tumor actually totally dispelled uh, based on the PET imaging. So it's actually a really uh, powerful treatment method. And he even like show up in some like a construction site. Actually, this is uh, several years ago also, and as a volunteer, and it looks very healthy. However, uh, we still have a certain room to further uh, enhance such treatment. For example, uh, currently the objective response rate is still like uh, quite low for most of the solid tumors, you can say below 20%. So that means uh, uh, 100 patients, only like, uh, uh, you know, fewer than 20 uh, patients really responded to such treatment. And the manuma could be a bit high, over like uh, 40%. And uh, one way is like to perform the combination treatment, like let's say the two antibodies, PD-1 or CDR4 uh, antibodies working together, right? And then can enhance this kind of objective response rate. But we still have certain room to be further improved. And another thing is like uh, uh, side effects, toxicity. And especially uh, clinically, since like more and more this kind of trials or treatments ongoing and more and more severe uh, side effects identified, especially associated with, for example, the cardiovascular inflammation. And also even some people develop type 1 diabetes, the brush level goes high. You know why? We just mentioned that you block this kind of interaction between the immune cells and the, the tumor cells. And meanwhile, you also block this kind of shaking hands uh, between the immune cells and the, 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 the normal cells. And later, they can also like uh, uh, attack the normal cells, the T cells, right? And if you attack the beta cells, as I mentioned, it's beta cells damaged and then the brush level goes high. Then how to uh, prevent that, how to uh, you know, uh, alleviate that. So probably the local and targeted delivery can help. And especially through this kind of, uh, you know, drug delivery systems, uh, you can enhance the local dosage in the delivery site, for example, in the tumor microenvironment. And then you can also reduce the risk of the systemic toxicity, right? And especially uh, through this kind of formulations, and you can um, especially regulate the expression of the specific receptors and ligands locally in the tumor microenvironment and further boost this kind of recruitment of the immune cells inside the tumor sites. Uh, we could like convert the uh, cooler tumor to hot tumor and to boost the treatment and efficacy. So then, simply, the micro needle can help. As I you know, said that, uh, you know, first of all, you know, in our group, we perform this kind of uh, micro needle repatch for the uh, insulin delivery. And later, we uh, simply borrow this kind of uh, tool from the subgroup of the diabetes and then uh, to the uh, cancer treatment group. Then we developed this kind of immune checkpoint inhibitors delivery uh, technology based on the micro needle patch. And they can locally enhance the retention time of the antibody to the tumor micro environment, okay? And uh, uh, certainly can uh, significantly enhance the treatment efficacy and enhance the survival of the mice. And uh, um, you can also load uh, the different uh, antibodies there and then you know, uh, can uh, further achieve this uh, combination treatment and efficacy. For example, here's like a uh, PD-1 antibody together with the CTR4, and then compared to the control groups, the efficacy can be significantly increased. And we can also further develop this kind of hollow structure based microneedle array patch, and especially based on the PVA uh, polymer. And uh, uh, you can see here the interesting thing that we can deliver the gas, deliver the uh, code atmospheric plasma through the uh, micro needle ray patch through this kind of hollow structure. And as such plasma actually can interact with the tumor cells. They can actually kill these kind of tumor cells, especially based on the uh, ROS, reactive oxygen species, also RNS, and then you know, to induce uh, immunogenic cell deaths and to boost uh, this kind of, um, uh, let's say, the treatment efficacy. Uh, especially, the, we can also load the antibody, you know, to the uh, shear part of the microneedle patch and uh, working together with the plasma, and then to enhance the kidney effect. And besides the microneedle patch, uh, we are also uh, interested in using these kind of cells as a delivery carriers 
And uh, here's like uh, we uh, apply the created it as carry uh, for and bodies, especially, you know, we uh, apply the uh, painted is and we can add the antibody to the surface of the painted is and they actually can uh, especially target to the surgical sites um, associated with the water site, associated with the bleeding site uh, during surgery, right? And so clinically, uh, once the, the doctors remove the primary tumor, actually it's really hard to completely remove all these kind of uh, micro tumors because one thing is like really hard to identify this kind of uh, tumor sites in the, in the corner. And another thing is like even identifying them, they still like hated to remove them because it potentially may affect the function of the patients. Then actually through this kind of technology, and we can deliver the patients with drugs to the surgical site. And then especially to inhibit the tumor recurrence or the metastasis uh, after the surgery. So based on the natural, targeting capability of the patients because this is actually their capability to uh, stop bleeding and this time they can bring the drug there, right? And especially the such patients can be uh, activated to form the patient derived particles and uh, um, you know, form such smaller uh, particles with the antibody uh, promoted to release and the further can uh, you know, enhance the interaction between the drug and the uh, radio tumor and also boost the recruitment of the immune cells. And we found that such patients can be activated and to promote the release of the antibody. And they can also accumulate in the surgical sites. And in the surgical site, we also identify some smaller particles like this. And also, you, you can see we build up such a tumor recurrence model, especially based on the B16F10 mouse myeloma, which is very aggressive. And you can see the mice treated with the patients with the antibody. The tumor recurrence can be significantly inhibited compared to the uh, control groups, like uh, just to deliver the patients or just to deliver the native antibody. And uh, they can also inhibit the tumor recurrence, tumor metastasis uh, associated with the lung tissues. Especially, actually, predators, uh, they can uh, actively interact with the circulating tumor cells. And especially based on this kind of specific ligand receptor, this kind of interaction. And then uh, they can also uh, potentially inhibit the metastasis associated with different organs. So here's just a simple demonstration and also can enhance the survival of the mice. And the patent-based uh, drug delivery system is currently also a major pipeline of our startup company, Zinc Capsule, and we are trying to also translate this technology. And the patents can be simply from the blood bank or from patients themselves. After certain, um, you know, simple separation, and you can load the drug to the surface of patents or some small molecule inside of the patients and later infuse back to the body and later they can specifically target the uh, bleeding site associated with surgery and then to inhibit the uh, recurrence, also the metastasis. And we further extend this technology. And this time uh, we link the patients with the drug to the hematopotent stem cell, HSC, uh, for treating leukemia, acute uh, mild leukemia. And as you know that after the chemotherapy and uh, one third of the patients easily develop them a recurrence, especially from the bone marrow site. And this time actually we can uh, deliver the therapeutics to the bone marrow site to uh, perform the local treatments and to inhibit the recurrence. So the idea is like uh, we leverage the homing capability of the HSC toward the bone marrow. And then just uh, let it uh, serve as the GPS and then bring the patients with the drug there and the data in the bone marrow, they can be activated, right? And release the antibody. And we call it like the combination cell therapy. Especially, you know, if you directly apply the uh, antibody to the surface of the HSC, it will affect the HSC's homing capability and may also like, uh, uh, you know, uh, hard to you know, promote the release of drug from HSC. And the HSC certainly can also eat this kind of antibody. Then through such cell cell conjugation method, uh, you know, they can effectively deliver the therapeutics to the uh, bone marrow site and uh, also like uh, significantly enhance the survival of the mice, especially uh, for the mouse model, we apply the C1498 uh, uh, AML mouse model, especially associated with uh, leukemia. 
and we can also genetically engineer the patents, allow the patents itself to uh, develop or to generate uh, such a receptor or ligand. Right here, it's like a, a, we can genetically engineer the patents with the uh, PT1 receptor, and inside the, the patents, and we can load the drug and this, to perform this kind of um, modulation inside of the tumor microenvironments. And uh, certainly, uh, the PD1 receptor can also bind to the PDL1 ligand associated with tumor sites. And that means, you know, such uh, privileges or later on driver particles itself can serve as the uh, therapeutic components. Meanwhile, as the drug delivery carrier. And the different ligands receptors can be expressed, and this time we can also uh, modify the patents with uh, the PDL1 ligand and uh, run in an operative way. Actually, they can operate away, they can actually um, typically um, target to the pancreas side and especially to uh, reverse the new onset of type 1 diabetes and especially perform this kind of immune suppression locally. And uh, you know, can well control the uh, branch level uh, associated with the new onset of type 1 diabetes. And uh, furthermore, we also uh, apply the patent driver particles, and this is actually uh, just a, a new publication. And especially, we can load the anti inflammation drug to the patent driver particles. Uh, later, we found that they can uh, highly accumulate in the lung site, especially associated with pneumonia. And this here is like we apply such anti inflammation drug to harm uh, the cytokine storm, which is very dangerous. As you know, that currently uh, for the COVID 19 uh, treatment, uh, many patients eventually die actually due to the uh, cytokine storm. And uh, potentially, let's say, uh, such uh, carriers can also help uh, calm the cytokine storm locally. And uh, um, as you know, that the prejudice actually is like uh, the, you know, play a better role regarding the tumor development, uh, the metastasis, right? And the prejudice actually, people found that they can. You know, interact with the tumor cells and have the tumor cell derived from the, let's say, the, 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 the leave from the primary site and later to anchor to other places to develop the metastasis. So, this is actually the better one. However, uh, we can convert them into the Trojan course, right? We can add a drug to it to leverage their interaction uh, toward the tumor cells, tumor site, and to boost the treatment efficacy. And uh, such charging course like the treatment method can be also applied to the adipocytes, the fat cells, And here you can see, you know, if you directly inject the fat cells to the tumor site, actually can uh, quickly boost the uh, development of the tumor because the fat cells actually can provide the, the energy to the, uh, you know, the tumor cells, the cancer cells, especially based on the lipid metabolism. And then, you know, here actually we can load the anti cancer drug to the adipocytes, to the fat cells. And once you inject such a uh, Trojan course, you know, to the uh, tumor site, and later we found that the you know, tumor size actually can be uh, significantly shrinking, especially based on the uh, lipid metabolism method, because here it's like we uh, allow the, uh, the, the fat cells uh, to load the uh, anti cancer drug with the lipid to the or droplet of the fat cell. And in the uh, tumor site, they can be released outside, especially also later uh, enter the tumor cells based on the uh, fatty acid binding protein, this kind of transport. And uh, uh, cells, microneedles, and we also simply apply the uh, hydrogels, like injectable hydrogels, load the drug inside, or this kind of sprayable hydrogels. And uh, we can actually design this kind of sprayer. And uh, we have two containers. And the one container with the drug, and once they spray outside, uh, the solution will mix to each other and quickly form the gels, especially based on the action between the, between the swamping and the, the uh, fibrin gene. And they, they, they can form the fibrin gene gel and the fibrin gel, let's say, and the, the, the drug actually uh, formulation inside, and they can uh, gradually release outside, especially based on the acidic environment of the uh, tumor and to boost the. Uh, the uh, dissociation of the nanoparticles here, and the, the antibody can gradually release outside, and this antibody actually can bind to the uh, don't eat me signal associated with tumor cells and allow the macrophage uh, to uh, identify them, to recognize them, to eventually destroy them. 
and we found that the uh, locally the increased uh, pH level due to the dissociation of the nanoparticles here, like the calcium carbonates, and actually can uh, boost the, uh, the, 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 the conversion of the macrophage uh, from M2 like phenotype to M1 like phenotype, and further can boost uh, the treatment efficacy. And certainly, you know, compare. Uh, with this kind of injectable gel based formulation, such as sprayable gel formulation actually can be more sufficient because they can, you know, easily um, arrive uh, at this kind of corners of the surgical sites. And not only uh, for treating uh, the primary tumor sites after surgery, uh, but also can also uh, treat this kind of metastasis uh, associated with a distant tumor. So here's like a brief a summary regarding the bioresponsible drug delivery system. And you can apply the synthetic materials or apply this kind of uh, biological particle cells as carriers to deliver drug. And indeed, indeed it's like fundamentally uh, interesting. And meanwhile, also uh, definitely have the clinical uh, translation potential. And just uh, like playing such a magic cube uh, as the design of such uh, formulations or devices uh, at the very beginning, you think you should think about many uh, this kind of different uh, perspectives, right? At least to form such tube. And for example, the biological triggers, the response actions, the material properties, and very importantly, the translation criteria. And you probably needed to predict uh, the clinical efficacy and the trying to use the more biocompatible materials. And also think about the, the manufacturing a uh, large scale, this kind of feasibility. And for fundamental research, you can also do many things, and you can uh, perform the combination triggers, right, to perform the program, the drug release system, and also um, apply the biomedical bioinspiring design, and the signal modulation could be also important. Sometimes the biomarkers, the physiological triggers could be not that sufficient, right? And then you can uh, treat uh, uh, these certain uh, chemicals, drugs first, or like apply the physical, uh, signals that say you shine the light or locally heated and to uh, tune this kind of biomarker uh, concentration. So for example, uh, this work is like uh, for the uh, CAR T therapy, especially you know, CAR T therapy as the immunotherapeutic uh, approach is like also uh, very promising. And uh, however, for the solid tumor treatment, it's still like uh, quite challenging, especially how to enhance the infiltration, the penetration of the CAR T inside solid tumors. So they are very challenging. And then we found that we can simply uh, pre-inject such nanoparticles with the photothermal response reagents and locally you know, shine the light to it. And then you know, to increase the temperature. And then we uh, further inject such CAR T cells. And later we found that the uh, tumor infiltration can be significantly enhanced and the outcome can be also uh, significantly improved. Also, as the bio-inspired drug delivery, uh, as I also mentioned, that you can do many things, a lot of opportunities here. And since actually, you know, we just understand the, the structure of the DNA, uh, let's say in the past 60 years, 70 years, and we just uh, learned the structure of the virus actually in the past like 90 years, based on the development of the TEM microscope. And this is picture actually within two years, right? As you know that this is the first picture of the black hole. So I'd like to say the things we can learn from nature are limited this. For drug delivery, enjoy fun and make impact. With that, I'd like to thank my students. Uh, actually, I need to uh, update my slide a bit. And because uh, uh, Chai Ying Hu actually, uh, together with uh, uh, Guo Chen, they just found uh, faculty positions uh, in US and uh, Canada. So congratulations. You will be professors very soon. And also wonderful collaborators, terrific supporter from the funding sources. So thank you so much. And I'm happy to, to take your questions. Thank you very much, Professor, for the very exciting talk. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions out there. But before the questions start to uh, jump in, I want to take the uh, uh, privilege of being the host, ask you a, a simple question. Um, so for this uh, type of um, a large loaded uh, uh, patch, right? You mentioned, uh, you know, in your 2015 PNS paper, 
people ask it the, the size of the load of the jog. And now you can significantly enhance this load um, by properly concentrating those jogs, those insulin into each one of the needles. So uh, as one of the principles we learned as a chemist uh, a student when I was in college, uh, we learned that even though those mechanisms can be very well controlled, the, there's a still an equilibrium over, over there. If you significantly enhance the concentration of those reactants, then that means the, uh, the, the, the equilibrium of the reaction will be pushed towards the uh, uh, product end, right? Because given, con uh, given condition of those uh, uh, temperature and the physiological condition in the human body, so the equilibrium constant should be very similar to each other. So uh, will those significantly loaded the drug uh, 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 accelerate the drug release um, uh, um, uh, higher at a rate that is higher than your design and maybe cause some any like a side effects? Do you have any comments on this? Yeah, actually, it's, it's a really professional uh, question. And uh, uh, indeed, it's like, uh, um, you know, we enhance the loading capacity, right, of the patch. And uh, uh, people may ask uh, uh, for this kind of uh, the concern regarding the uh, release profile. And, uh, you know, uh, people question, hey, it's like, a, is there any like a burst release, something like that, right? And, uh, you know, can quickly release the insulin outside. And here it's like we, um, you know, um, perform this kind of library screening method and we, identify this kind of, uh, you know, the specific monomers and also uh, we optimize the uh, manufacturing, um, let's say the fabrication, um, you know, uh, this kind of uh, ratio of this kind of monomers inside and they're trying to, you know, achieve, um, you know, the, the relatively, uh, let's say, little order, like a more linear release instead of like a, just like burst release, right? And meanwhile, still like uh, keep this kind of uh, mechanism regarding the glucose responsible uh, control. Yeah, mm. we do have such a optima uh, optimization here, yeah. I see. Yeah, thank you for the answer. So, okay, yeah. uh, let's go to the question. Professor Gu, uh, great talk for the glucose responsive smart insulin patch. How to calibrate personally? Yeah, this is a good question. How long it takes? Yes, so uh, nice question. And uh, especially uh, here, it's like a we uh, design this kind of patch. It's like a for one patch one day or two or three patches every day, especially for the uh, post meal uh, glucose control. So that means uh, you put a patch on before the uh, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, right? Then, you know, uh, for this kind of uh, glucose control. And uh, uh, so that means uh, uh, especially we, we want to compare with the uh, currently, especially uh, many people, over 90% of people are using this kind of uh, uh, subcutaneous injection of the insulin. And uh, uh, then, you know, based on this kind of transdermal patch, it uh, could be much easier. And uh, certainly for the uh, original usage of the patch, and the patients still needed to uh, monitor the brush level and to get this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, relationship, you know, between the uh, glucose control and the dosage uh, of the patch used, as I mentioned, uh, you know, um, different patches with different dosages uh, will be uh, provided, and then you know, uh, based on the general uh, glucose level, they can select this kind of the uh, the, the the best or the uh, perfect uh, uh, patch to use. So here it's like also involve this kind of personalized uh, medication here, and we will provide uh, multiple uh, choices. Yeah. Yeah, this is also uh, maybe like this artificial intelligence can, you know, potentially make some uh, uh, contribution here. So uh, the second uh, yeah. question is, uh, Professor Gu, congratulations for your great uh, achievement in science and technology. And also you move forward uh, to commercialization. How to balance your professional career in both sides, which is the biggest, uh, biggest problem you met till now? This is also my question for you. I'm always amazed at how you manage your time, you know, in all those different uh, sectors. Yeah, so here's like, a, uh, you know, uh, suddenly, um, let's say the lab is like the center of the uh, generation of the innovations, right? It's like uh, um, the formulation is actually generated in the lab. And later, you know, that's why we run this kind of startup uh, companies, you know, and later to license them to the company and then to uh, further bring this kind of technology uh, move forward, especially, you know, we also hire, like, let's say, CEOs and also, uh, you know, the employees, you know, in, 
in our companies, and they will actually further this kind of translation process. And uh, for myself, I you know sometimes provide this kind of uh, you know uh, let's say advice, and uh, especially uh, this is another thing. Like uh, people always ask me, why you want to like uh, you know um, license your technology to the to your startup company instead of just directly to this kind of big farmers. And sometimes you know this kind of technology actually is like a, still like a, let's say uh, your baby, right? And you actually understand uh, this kind of properties uh, or some know-how of this kind of uh, technology or product, right? And uh, if you directly like license license to the big farmer, and then somehow sometimes you know due to this kind of the uh, management or something like that, and uh, may not well bring the technology move forward. But to your own startup company, and uh, definitely uh, you really care about new technology, and uh, you have sort of passion. And also this kind of uh, let's say the let's say know-how something like that, and then one more step to bring it to the clinical side, especially uh, you can quickly occupy this kind of um, you know technologies. And uh, so here's like uh, the, the, the general message is like uh, uh, you still run your lab, and this is the key job, right? As a professor, you know you need to train your students, you need to teach in a class, and uh, for the translation side. You can just license, you can run a startup company and you can license your technology and then to you know, have another team to help. And regarding the uh, fixed uh, problem, you know, here's like, a, you know, for myself, I'm still also like a learning process, right? You know, uh, I'm not an entrepreneur, uh, you know, let's say, right? It's like, uh, even now it's like, I mean, uh, several years ago, you know, I, I needed to learn this kind of uh, uh, words, right? Regarding how to uh, run this kind of startup companies. And uh, I think uh, for most uh, uh, professors or scientists, uh, I think uh, uh, you know you, you definitely need to uh, have some friends or professional uh, person you know to help you you know to um, you know for example run a company and also to uh, you know form this kind of the bigger picture the timeline regarding the development of your technology. So this is actually another thing. It's like uh, once I was in North Carolina, North Carolina is like uh, um, several years ago, and I actually initiated the, the program, a professional science master degree program, so for the translational innovation program, that's say train, right? Train, then uh, innovation, IA, right? Translation innovation program, train program. Especially, this is a one year based program, and we are trying to, um, how do you say it, to train this kind of specific uh, person and it's for students later after graduation, they can boost this kind of translation from the bench side to the better side. Actually, this moment we do need this kind of a person to boost this kind of translation or innovation, right? Currently, let's say to be honest, the gap between the bench to the better side is still huge. And uh, then such person actually they not only learn this kind of fundamental uh, stuff, but also you know, uh, get this kind of courses in the business school, in the uh, college or management. And also they directly talk to the clinical side, the doctors, also to the industry side, okay? And uh, to identify this kind of problems. And uh, during this kind of training process, and they also, you know, especially get this kind of knowledge, how to efficiently uh, bring a certain technology uh, to the, uh, you know, uh, translation side. And especially also based on the, you know, very original motivations based on the clinical needs, also the industry needs, okay? And this is actually, you know, based on this kind of needs, you can make such a better balance between the innovation and the translation. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, perfect answer. I also need some of this uh, training program as well, uh, if there's an opportunity. Uh, the third question is, uh, hi, Professor Gu, thank you for your nice talk. I'm uh, Rui Xunfu from the University of California, UCLA. This is uh, from the same university, from, from lab to Great. bench to market in the future. What do you think? Okay, the third question, yeah. What do you think is the key point to translate your technology of smart insulin hatch? Yes, so, uh... So this moment, we already, uh, you know, demonstrated this kind of efficacy and safety on the large animal, right? The mini pigs, and currently the whole team actually prepared the IND application materials, and we were submitted to FDA very soon. And during this kind of process, especially now due to the COVID-19 crisis, 
and uh, you know uh, most of people are at home working at home especially you know but there is sufficient time sufficient time to prepare this kind of uh, materials okay so um you know uh, this moment we are also like uh, looking for the serious fee uh you know investments especially you know to further like uh, uh once approved you know by fda we will actually uh uh perform the uh, phase one clinical trial immediately and uh, regarding the patient's recruitment or something like that and uh, we will actually um you know uh look forward to that so i mean one thing is like regarding technology side certainly uh you know we have this kind of further developments as 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 like a uh, technology is like always like a first generation second generation right and moving forward and the country we focus on the uh the development of technology and bring it to the um you know the king side travel best and but certainly in the uh company side uh, you know we will further like develop the 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 the, the next generation okay always you know uh look forward right and uh, trying to make things like better and better yeah definitely okay so the fourth question professor gu very impressive talk my mom has been suffering uh, from diabetic many years and uh, really looking forward to your smart hatch when you can come to the market does we got fd approved i think you already answered some of those questions but this is your chance to have some more comments yeah sure so actually very nice question and we received the, the uh, similar emails actually uh, very often and uh, uh sss like currently uh, still like trying to get the, the approval from fda side and uh, if everything like goes well, and it may take several years, but certainly also like uh, based on the results of the next clinical trials, as you know, that's regarding the drug discovery, regarding the formulation and translation, we need to pass uh, several different stages of the clinical trials, especially phase one to uh, write to the safety, phase two, especially to uh, highlight this kind of efficacy, right? And then we look forward to that. Very nice, very nice. As a, oh, okay, final question. Uh, the last one, congratulations for your nice talk and nice work. For the drug delivery technology, can it be automatically operated by remote control? Yes, uh, I think an excellent question. And uh, uh, currently actually, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, many research groups also trying to, uh, you know, uh, where did this kind of, uh, you know, uh, aims, right? And uh, uh, especially, uh, probably, as you know, that's, you know, um, uh, Bob Langer, you know, my postdoc advisor at MIT, and they, uh, you know, already developed the so called microchip technology. And they can actually, uh, you know, load the drug into this kind of the chip based devices and, you know, like a multiple randomness, right? Multiple randomness. And they can apply this kind of CMOS uh, system and it, it's especially also combine the wireless control system you know, to control the release of drug from the certain uh, very small uh, randomness. And then, you know, especially for some cases, like for the, uh, you know, uh, let's say every a few days, you need to uh, inject some drug, right? And then through this kind of implantable device, you can implant such a microchip, this kind of bit, right? And to the body, and then use the wireless system to control it. And this is just one example, and I think I think next, you know, regarding the drug delivery, regarding this kind of uh, interdisciplinary um, collaboration with the different uh, exciting uh, fields, especially like uh, AI technology, and uh, you really think about that, the future is very, very exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay, what's the next one? Zhejiang University, Ethan, uh, Professor Gu, thank you for your wonderful talk. The hydrogen micro needles introduced are fascinating for therapy. Are they effective and easy for manufacturing? I think you, you touched a lot on this, but uh, you have anything more to comment on this one? Yes, so uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it's like, uh, uh, especially compared to our previous development, uh, the kind of this kind of uh, motor based measure, you know, just the Directly apply the photo uh, polymerization uh, approach, you know, to uh, form the microneedle patch. Actually, uh, relatively uh, easy uh, regarding this kind of manufacturing. And in our company side, and we also, you know, uh, accumulated the certain know how regarding the manufacturing and uh, you know trying to uh, you know uh, let's say that the, the uh, uh, 
bring this kind of micro needle array patch uh, fabrication uh, easier and easier. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I'm sure this patch, the scalable manufacturing and the cost issue uh, is going to be critical for commercialization. So the number seven question is from Wuhan University of Science and Technology from a audience for, uh, uh, called Lian Zhu. Dear Professor Gu, excellent work. Can micro needle array be used to treat solid tumor? How do you improve the local concentration without direct touch? Yes, so uh, one example I already showed, right, for the myeloma treatment, and certainly you can also develop other approaches for treating other uh, tumors, and not only locally, also through this kind of systemic uh, delivery, especially, you know, based on the uh, delivery of the immunotherapeutic drug. Okay, so, you know, chemotherapeutic drug is chemotherapy, let's say, it's like they, uh, they are more like efficient locally. And uh, uh, it's really hard to treat the distant tumor or metastasis site. And however, regarding the uh, immunotherapy, and then you, you, you treat the certain disease locally, and then later on they can also train this kind of immune cells to identify the similar uh, tumor associated antigen and then to attack the uh, distant tumor site. So then you know, can also achieve the systemic treatment uh, you know, efficacy. And regarding the uh, uh, local concentration, yes, so uh, certainly this is also associated with uh, so-called pharmacokinetics, uh, biodistribution, this kind of PKPD uh, characterization. And uh, uh, you know, then you know, definitely need some uh, you know, systemic uh, characterization uh, approaches you know, and to uh, uh, detail this kind of um, you know, the relationship between the dosage and the efficacy. Yeah, very nice. Are there any more questions? Okay, if not, let's look. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's my great honor. Thank you. <laughs>